Since the jurist system isn't going to loom over this trial in particular, I'd like to name several huge inspirations for me to make this video. One is Nezumi VA, whose professional tier voice dubbing combined with wonderful video making skills have invigorated my fire to make a review as big as this is. She is far from the only such YouTuber I've watched, but her race attorney videos are the most in-depth reviews of each game I've watched. I was initially going to voice act the entire Apollo Justice trilogy before editing any of it, but seeing the notification for her retrospective of this game inspired me to start this process almost immediately after finishing my dub of this game. I still haven't watched her video, as I don't wish to plagiarize her work. I intend to watch it once I've finished editing everything else, and if I feel it to be necessary, I'll include some sort of response at the end. Beyond Nezumi's work, there are many channels who've inspired me to take up voice acting and let's playing in general. I watch very few of them nowadays, but shoutouts to Save Data, Tyranny as Let's Dub Project, The Game Grumps, The Runaway Guys, Radical Soda, and Pokemon Challenges. It's unlikely that this will be the last time I thank any of them. They have my eternal gratitude for showing the potential of playing and reviewing video games. Finally, the inspiration for me to rate this review as quickly as I've been able to. The Ace Attorney Investigations Collection. It was announced as I was making weekly uploads, and at this rate I'm going to fan up both games in full HD with Story Mode on as soon as I upload the full review of this game. Calls to action go burr. Make sure to click the links in the description to follow me both here and on Twitch, and discuss everything I do on my Discord server. Wow! Showdown time. I... I lost. It's only a game of poker. A game I've played for a long time, and only lost twice. Who was the first? The man I killed, of course. Well, it seems I found a partner I've been looking for all along. Over a game of cards? Why, yes, over a game of cards. That was how we first met. Seven years ago. Shadi Enigmar, a name which ought to be half familiar, shows up in the defendant lobby. A mysterious girl in an also familiar red outfit, calling the defendant her daddy, is excited that her first show is today, and she's just as excited to give Phoenix a scrap of paper that she got from someone in the hall. Phoenix knows that the paper looks like a diary page. Shadi knows that he changed attorneys just yesterday. Despite this, he assures with a boisterous laugh he will not be found guilty, to which the girl, whom he calls Trucy, agrees. While it's Phoenix's last trial, it's Clavier Gavin's first, and he's arguably more aggressive here than he ever is to Apollo. That's surely just to up the difficulty in the gameplay. Similarly to his appearance in Turnabout Serenade, I decided to give him a mix between his normal accent and his learned German, implying that he hadn't mastered his European influence just yet. He gets more German as the trial drags on. Watch the dub, please. Links in the description, and so on. Detective Dick Gumshoe is called to the stand, a long-standing character from the original trilogy. While he only has one testimony, it provides Phoenix with lots of information. Shani's accused of killing his mentor, Magnify Grammarie, who'd been in the hospital for over a year with just a few months to live, thanks to liver cancer and diabetes. In fact, an empty insulin syringe was found near the victim's body. Apparently, Magnify sent Shadi, also known as Zack, a letter asking him to shoot one shot square in the forehead at 11.05pm. An IV bag would be given every half hour, hence the strange time. On to the cross-examination, its gameplay sticks out to me. Most of these segments require just one presentation of evidence, or maybe a press and then a present, but here, Phoenix has to press on two different statements, each providing even more information for the knowledge-starved attorney, and to then object. After one press, Phoenix looks at a photo of the seed, pointing out that a clown down in the room has a bullet hole as well, in its forehead no less. Phoenix is confident in his objectioning, a stark contrast to Apollo's reckless and bombastic behavior. His experience and wit from the past three games have carried him far, and they're on full display here. Asking about the guns used shows that the ballistic markings match the gun's type, and that the weapon is from one of Troop Grammarie's old magic tricks. Despite its size, it can only hold one bullet. Clavier and the detective initially argued that Zack could have shot both the clown doll and Magnify, but now we know how impossible that would have been. If the pistol holds just one bullet, he couldn't have shot both targets. Phoenix has turned this case around in record time. Even new players should now realize this level of skill that Phoenix has, if they didn't realize it during Turnabout Trump. Clavier has another witness, but before he's called, the judge declares a recess, and Phoenix finally has time to speak with his client. 
the letter Magnify wrote mentioned a reason Zack had to come, and he won't say what that reason was. But he does explain that, when he arrived, two pistols and a sleeping Magnify were laid out in front of him. Supposedly, this letter was far from the first instance of blackmail on Magnify's end. Zack used one of the pistols to shoot the clown, and put it in his pocket. He says that Magnify woke up and the two chatted, but again, he won't say what about. It's time for the trial to resume. Clavier confirms that a bullet was found in the clown's head, with similar ballistic markings to the one from Magnify's. He calls his witness, who is none other than... Perhaps we will start by asking your name and occupation. Valt Grammarie! Magician! Uh, and you're the decisive witness, are you? You can prove your fellow student your partner's guilt? Fate! The grand illusion, filled with traps and tricks! Wait, the shooting took place in the hospital after 11 o'clock at night. If you're a witness, does that mean you were there that late? If one were to deduce this logically, the conclusion is... YES! Can I just say that Valent and Zack are hilarious characters? They're just so goofy, it almost excuses Valent being such a stickler about his magic in the previous case. Valent's story is similar to Zack's. He received a letter to come to the hospital, though his was scheduled for 11.20. Like Zack, he has no intention of saying why Magnify was able to influence them to come, and he claims that he shot the clown, meaning that his mentor was already dead when he'd come in. Valent agrees that only one gun was present when he arrived, but Phoenix is quick to point out that the ballistic markings matched the pistol from the scene. Valent's on the ropes, but Clavier steps in. When the analyses of Magnify's bullet was carried out, he didn't know there were two guns. Technically, the analysis only revealed the type of gun, and now, it's a brilliant writing. You said you'd verified the murder weapon. Which is why I'm apologizing to you now, quite sincerely on my dad. Would you hold me accountable for a mistake made in my youth? That was just this morning. I am still young. And that my dad, it wasn't really my fault. If the defendant had only admitted that one is from the scene of the crime, we would not be having this present discussion now. The writing and situational play in this case, by the way, is beautiful. Even though the player, Phoenix, has next to no information, he feels fully in control of the case compared to the novice Clavier. However, as information and contradictions are revealed, Clavier gets his feet wet with solving his own case's contradictions. He becomes more and more confident in himself as the trial progresses, as if he's begun to steer the argument to a destination of his own choosing. Allegro time. Fallon claims that he called a doctor, who specified the time of death as 11.10 p.m. Clavier rehashes that Magnify's IV was filled every half hour, and, since the bag was two-thirds full, it would have been ten minutes past eleven. Phoenix presses this idea, and Valent gives thanks to his lucky color. I love that his color isn't mentioned, but it's pretty damn obvious at this point. Phoenix and the player ought to have enough experience to realize that it's yellow, and, if they've looked at the photo of the crime for long enough, they should have realized that the IV in the bag is green. Valent is shocked to see this, and Clavier shows that, in a clear bag, the liquid is yellow but the blue bag in the victim's room has given it that green tint. Valance really on the ropes now. The witness was confident and correct in saying that the IV liquid was yellow. But how did he know? He'd seen it before, on its own. The empty insulin syringe had been wiped down. It had been tampered with. Valant could have easily used it to refill the IV bag and implicate his partner. Clavier is not done. For one, there's no proof that Valant did anything with their syringe. More importantly though, Clavier has one final piece of evidence to prove his case. A diary. Oh no. If a feeling of dread hasn't set in yet, it will. Clavier flips to the last page of the diary, which claims that whether anything else is written depends on his hand, presumably referring to Zack's. A suspiciously obvious error comes after this page, but no more words. Either Phoenix gives up here, or he presents a single page in a book. I left with no choice but to show my own evidence. No choice indeed. We know what's about to happen. This trial was presented with no chance of victory, and yet Phoenix has pressed on. The player has pressed on. The game gives the player a sense of pervasive dread, quickly lets it fade as Phoenix's skill and experience carry him through the case, and brings it up again right at the end, like a horror game's jump scare. Phoenix shows the mysterious torn page, and explains that, since Magnify continued writing in the diary, he must have been alive after Zack left. Therefore, Valant was the one who shot him. It's completely sound logic, and Clavier's final piece of evidence is refuted easily. Too easily. But, but wait, this is, that's impossible. That old man couldn't have written that. Objection! Finally. That five second pause is the game's doing. Five seconds of silence. 
You know what Phoenix has just done. Clavier certainly knows. Valance's wording, not too dissimilar to Christoph Gavin's when Apollo presented the bloody ace, suggests that even he knows that this diary page shouldn't exist. Phoenix has no idea and stands by his evidence. Clavier asks that the gallery and current witness be temporarily excused. He has a new witness to call, and it should be obvious who that is. Now, let me just say that while I love the execution of this trial scenes, including Drew's testimony, this is one of the stupidest ideas in the history of Ace Attorney. It's practically the opposite of Turnabout Serenade. For one, almost every prosecutor before this game has presented forged or misleading evidence multiple times or gotten witnesses to lie. In fact, Manfred von Karma, the main villain of the very first game, was proven to have fabricated evidence and only received a nebulous penalty, after which he continued prosecuting for 15 more years. Edgeworth was proven to have submitted forged evidence and rise to the ashes, but no action was taken against him. To be fair, it was proven right then that he didn't know himself. Franziska von Karma even took an illegal photo and deliberately influenced the judge with it in her first case against Phoenix. You may recall that I said Clavier has an eye for the truth above all else. It's a good thing he does, because the hypocrisy of Phoenix losing his batch here is just flat out silly. Again though, the writing of this trial is impeccable. Clavier was tipped off that the defense had forged evidence on its side, which beautifully explains why he forces Phoenix into playing on hard mode despite being a novice. The trial raises more questions than answers, what with Magnify getting both Zack and Valent to play a game of life and death with him, and with Valent so eager to frame Zack for the crime. These questions wouldn't be answered for another seven years, but as far as the law is concerned, the defendant's guilt right now is without question at all. Then again, Zack did say a guilty verdict would be impossible. Just what did he mean by that? Though I deeply regret having to declare a verdict in this way, this trial is over. You have the right to find a new attorney and make an appeal. However, this court must... Ah, your honor. Yes, Mr. Zack? There is one thing I wish to make clear. Today, in this courtroom, you cannot declare me guilty. It is impossible. I'm afraid the defendant is quite mistaken. I most certainly have the authority to declare a verdict on you. Except, tell me, how do you plan on announcing your verdict? When your defendant does not exist. Does it exist? What are you talking about? I am talking... About this! Mr. Enigma! And we're back to amazing ideas paired with goofy writing this time. The use of the Grammarie theme brings a lot of light to this dark trial, and it's such a shock that I struggle not to laugh every time it happens. If you can't tell, my feelings on this case go back and forth, much like Phoenix's last trial. Is this case written badly with great ideas, or does this game execute its lackluster concepts in exemplary fashion? I suppose the only way to know is to delve deeper. Soon enough, the Mason system will have Phoenix dig through both the past and the present to solve the mysteries of Magnify's murder, Drew's and Vera's poisonings, and more.